I will stand and moderate, that's what I'll do. So. Hello everyone, hopefully you have energy for the last one. I'm Robert Hernandez, I am not in the program book <laughs> because the moderator fell ill, came out negative, so no uh, Rona for her, so she's just ill, so they asked me to step in. Uh, my name is Robert Hernandez, I'm a digital journalism professor at USC in Los Angeles. Um, my students and I are here repping our work under the name of journalism, where we use emerging technologies to tell award-winning nonfiction immersive stories, journalism. Uh, and it's my honor to meet a couple of these folks in person that we did not know, uh, reconnect with someone I met as a student before she freaking took off in the stratosphere and immersive, and someone behind and involved with some tech that my students used. Um, and we're going to be talking about the immersive storytelling and its importance in our industry. Um, I prefer that they introduce themselves because they'll be their own hype people to really describe what they do well. So, Michaela, why don't we start with you and we'll work our way through the panel. Um, who you are, what you do, and uh, yeah, we'll start there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Robert, for stepping in. <laughs> Give Robert a hand. <laughs> Uh, my name is Michaela Ternaski Holland. Currently, I am a full time consultant for Games for Change, which is a nonprofit organization that has been around for almost 20 years. The stuff is in the name. They have been behind the ideology of game making for change making for a very long time. And they have recently opened up a new vertical called XR for Change. My current work for them is focused on the brand new virtual reality documentary called On the Morning You Wake to the End of the World, which was a collaboration by Atlas V and Archer's Mark, otherwise well known for their work with Notes on Blindness. And the project I'm currently managing, it's Impact Campaign. I'm currently overseeing everything that happens not only inside the headset, but outside of the headset, from activations with partnerships to social media, website, um, as well as the actual in-person physical activations, high school curriculum, you name it, it's probably coming across my desk. Um, but on the other hand, before my work with Games for Change slash on the side with Games for Change, I'm also a creator. So I know and understand what it is to make and build amazing experiences in XR, whether that's with a focus on documentary, social impact, or journalism. It all works for me and with me, whether it's as a creative brain and a producer brain and impact brain. So I'm really excited to be on this panel and nerd out with the fellow panelists that are here today with me. Welcome, welcome. Caitlin? Uh, I'm Caitlin, a self-confessed nerd. Um, I'm also a creator producer, and so I work at a company called Scatter. We're an Emmy award-winning technology studio. We create our own immersive uh, productions. Um, we also create a, a tool called DepthKit, which is a solution for volumetric video. So it's a way to capture real people in three dimensions, kind of like a hologram, um, and bring real people into 3D virtual um, environments. Uh, and prior to uh, working at Scatter, um, I ran an artist lab in South Africa, my home country, um, where uh, the idea was to facilitate folks um, across Africa who are working in different creative mediums and want to bring new technologies into their creative practice, um, kind of opening up the door to, to make that possible. Victor? So my name is Victor. I'm the co-founder and a producer at Targo. Targo, we are a virtual reality documentary studio. So what we do is very simple. We try to take true stories and bring them into virtual reality. So we've done this for the past uh, four years. My co-founder, the journalist, she's directing all the documentaries we've, uh, we've done. And there's two things we look for in all the pieces that we are producing. The first one is creating a virtual encounter with someone who has an extraordinary story. And the second one is unlocking uh, crazy access places that have disappeared that are just close to the public and making them accessible to, uh, to everyone. So we've been making more than 15 documentaries in the past. We got two Emmy nominations. Our last uh, documentaries were produced uh, with Meta, uh, with MetaQuest, uh, and are available online on, uh, on Oculus TV. Our last project uh, that we released this September is the story of uh, a survivor of the 9-11 attacks. She was buried 27 hours under the rubble before uh, being, be, be, being rescued. And the documentary shares her story from the moment she arrived in the US to the, her life today and going back to ground zero for, for the first time. So I'm very glad to be uh, on this panel to talk about storytelling, how we can share these kind of stories uh, with everyone through virtual reality in the headset and also outside of the headset. So I'm very glad to, to be here. Awesome. Round of applause. Round of applause. Uh, 
I'd like to see in the audience, raise your hand if you're a content creator. Uh, okay, cool. Um, I was sharing with the panel that I, I became a professor in 2009, and I think I became the AWE 2010, 2011. And at the time, I was the only content creator here. It was hella nerds with like uh, garage-based glasses and things like that. And it's been great to see the evolution of this technology, but the light bulb going off in the industry, realizing cool tech alone is not enough. Content is king, is how it's, that saying goes. But the impact of that content is super important. Uh, you've each been in the industry for more than a minute, right? You, you, you're veterans if you've been here for like a year. Um, <laughs> how have you seen content change? And specifically, content is a really big umbrella. There's content for marketing, content for like engagement, but you all do storytelling, right? How have you seen the industry evolve with the type of stories that you tell? Anyone can answer that. It's a, uh, I think w what we are seeing is just that there's, uh, I mean, as creators, one of the things that we've seen evolve is just the appetite for storytelling. You know, when, when VR started and when we got in the industry, it was four years ago, uh, everything was very polarized into uh, gaming. You know, you had on one side, you have very much games, and on the other side, you had very artistic experiences that were difficult to find, you know, uh, their audience, or that would just uh, stick to uh, film festivals uh, kind of circuits. And what we're seeing now is that there's more and more pieces uh, that we're also trying to create that have a sort of like a mainstream uh, approach, right? So stories that the kind of thing that you could watch on TV, but that just get adapted to VR, and just content that just happens to be good content, good stories that are making their way uh, to virtual reality, and on which you have like a clear reason to be in VR. One, one of the last ones that I'm thinking of is, uh, I don't know if you've heard about the piece called The Soloist, uh, which is an adaptation to VR of the film Free Solo, and on that piece you get you know, the, the feeling of actually being next to Alex Honnold, who's actually hanging from, from cliffs, so, I feel like we have very good VR stories now that are you know, coming out on a more regular basis and that are really targeting uh, just everybody. And I think that's the big change that we've seen. It's like we're going out of a, a sort of like a niche market where we're trying to address mainstream audiences and just everyone and not only the gaming community. Great. Well, who's seen some changes? My first, uh, I come from a film background. It's my first like non-traditional 2D flatty thing. Um, involved, you know, strapping together some GoPros with some tape, basically, um, which was fun, figuring out, like, what can a new storytelling medium be? Um, and I think back on that now, I'm like, that's crazy, like, pushing, it was so hard and bad, and, you know, everything was new and still kind of being uh, figured out. Um, but I think about the way that we're working now, and it's kind of the same thing. We've come so far in terms of what's possible now, and if I wanted to make that same project now, it would be so much easier because yeah. the tools are in place. But no one stayed complacent in terms of, okay, well, that's all we ever wanted to do. We just wanted to figure out how to do this one thing well, and that's it. Every single project that um, I work on that I see other people working on is constantly like, pushing the boundaries of like how can new technologies um, create new forms of expression, and how is that opening up new modes of storytelling? Which means that every single project is still very hard, and it's always a headache, and it's never finished. Yes. Yeah, I tell my students, um, we, you, when you duct tape together the GoPros, what can you film before they overheat? And the nightmare of stitching and all this stuff. Did one GoPro die or was it in a photo mode per, instead of video mode? All these nightmares we don't have to deal with because we have other set, a new set of headaches and challenges. Mm -hmm. What have you seen? I would say the, the biggest thing I've seen is the length of time. Like in 2016, mm -hmm. it was like this big voodoo thing to never put someone in headset for more than maybe 10 minutes. And if you were, first of all, if you had a piece that was 10 minutes long, whether it was 360 video, immersive video, or if it was like a volumetric VR experience where you could walk around and pick things up, it was like, it better not be longer than 10 minutes because A, wow, you did that, but also B, you never knew how your audience would react because that's way too long to be in headset. And now we're seeing these projects that are 45 minutes long, an hour long, some even an hour and 15 long, and the audience is okay with that. And that's been a huge relief for us, I think, as maybe more long form storytelling who don't just want to show one, two, three, quick in and out. That might be the festival appetite at certain moments where you're trying to pull people yeah. through. But what I'm seeing now is like, we're not just thinking about getting the story done, but we're now thinking about 
well, what if I do this in chapters? And what if I just show one chapter for when I'm doing a 20 minute long activation? And then what if I show all three chapters, the full one hour experience for a different type of audience? And that's really exciting because that means we can go deeper into the impact we can make. We can go deeper into the authenticity of the stories we make. And now with photogrammetry and volumetric capture, as people who tell real life stories, there's a deeper authenticity that we can tell now that's not just computer generated. So, it's all been playing hand in hand, and it's been really exciting to see not only us as creators being like, this is cool, right? But seeing the audience respond to it and saying, I didn't even feel like I was in headset for 20 minutes. I didn't feel like I was in headset that's for an best. hour. And that's always such a great feeling. Yeah, the best compliment we got was someone said, like, I've watched immersive stuff, and the videos are so gimmicky. The <laughs> technology is in the way. Uh, and the best compliment we got was, like, I get it now. The technology just burrowed blurred into the background as I was engrossed into the experience, into the story. Um, as you can see, we don't have any slides. What the panel wanted to do was to have a conversation. And so we're not going to wait till the end if you have questions. If you have a question, come on up. If panelists want to ask each other questions, please do so. Totally informal. Uh, we're just having a conversation, nerding out as content creators in this emerging space. And I will ask the question that everyone asks me, and I'm sure they ask you. What makes a good story in the immersive space? <laughs> so what is your go-to answer or advice for someone who's trying to create non-gimmicky, non-shovelware, you know, adapting TV to, to 360, to do quality immersive experiences? What's your advice for that type of storytelling? We'll go the other way. So Kelly, go, go first on this one. Um, the question is always like, can it already be told in 2D? And if so, is 2D, like, like really, for me, I always ask, like, is, it, is it quantity of people you want to see your experience or quality of people you yeah. want to see your experience? Because when you, when you commit to immersive, when you commit to interactive, you're really going for quality. You're not going for quantity. You're not going for the big Netflix splashy premiere where all your friends can suddenly download your piece of content and watch it. You're not going for the quick, like, oh, I'm publishing it on YouTube as a web series. You're really going for that long game. Even if it's 360 video, you want to think about the long game. But I also think about an immersive interactive storytelling as really a piece of, and I hate to put it this way, a piece of IP. Like, my background's with Disney. I, I worked and performed with Disney. And I always think about, they don't just create a film, right? They don't just create like Moana and then Moana lives and dies in the movie theaters and on Disney Plus. They create Moana and then they create the theme park experience of Moana. Then they create the merchandise for Moana. And then they create the Moana this, the Moana that. And suddenly it's not just a piece of content, but it's an actual IP that's transmedia and its own sort of orbit of planetary content that you can create and build. And I really think when we're talking about specifically impact. You want to create a piece of storytelling that can have that kind of orbit or planetary content so that you can constantly build rabbit holes for your audience to fall into your pieces of content. So can you create a really, a really robust Instagram, Twitter feed, website based on the piece of content you're creating for immersive interactive storytelling? Can you also create a really amazing export that you can then send to a museum? Can you create a really gorgeous digital mapping experience? These, are, these might all feel like things you'd say, Michaela, those are all distribution mm -hmm. end. But really, I think of those things as the start of creative, because I'm also thinking about partnerships. Right? If I'm doing a piece about nuclear disarmament, is there a really strong movement in nuclear disarmament where we can find really key partnerships to not only fund, but to promote, to not only talk about, to also expand? Because I think the biggest need that I'm feeling personally as a creator is to step outside of the film festival bubble. We get kind of scratched on the back by the same people we see every time we're there, and that's great. But I want to see my piece living and breathing in the actual public spaces. And that's kind of, to me, where things move both ways. So, when someone approaches me with a story, I'm thinking these 3,000 steps ahead to how that story could or couldn't be a good impact storytelling, even just with the content itself, but also with the way it could live and breathe in the future. Galen, what's your answer to that question? Uh, stories are about characters. Um, and if you can generate a character that's compelling, and interesting, relatable, you love them, you hate them, but there's that feeling of connection uh, with another human being, um, I think that that's essential for a good story. Um, and I think it might actually be impossible to have an entirely bad story as long as you have some kind of compelling character, authentic character, well-developed character within that arc. And I think that's what you're talking about, the world building that Disney does. 
um, that's character driven. You couldn't have a Moana uni universe yeah. if you didn't have this figurehead at the center of it that people can connect to. Victor? No, I, I totally relate to this. And one thing that as a, as a producer I'm always looking for is something technical, creative, proper to VR that you can't achieve with any other media. So for instance, on the 9-11 on the piece, on the, the story of the survival that we did, uh, one of the key starting points was, of course, her story. But we wanted to find something new that we could tell through VR that, was not, that had not already been told through other media. So we searched through the web. We actually looked for a lot of archive. And at some point, we found that some photographers in the 90s had taken like 360 pictures in New York on you know, like actual film, like negatives. Uh, and so that we could find like panoramas of New York with the, with the World Trade Center in 360. Yeah. And that got us started like if few people had done this, there may have been like actually a lot of photographers that had done this. So we digged a lot in the web archives and we found a lot of panoramas of New York in the 90s with the World Trade Center and we recreated a sort of like a walkthrough of New York with the Twin Towers. And when you get the story, the character, you know, narrating her arrival in the US, in New York, living the American dream and you're able to stand on the plaza of the World Trade Center looking up at the Twin Towers, that's the kind of thing that only VR can, brings you, can bring you, and that's the kind of thing we're always looking for. That's one example of like, you know, bringing you in the past uh, in a way that no other media can. But for instance, right now we're working on a piece where we're thinking about how can we shrink the viewer at a size of like a sort of like a, a, a Lego man, you know? And that's the kind of thing that VR can achieve. And we need a story, we need a character, but we always want to find a creative twist that when people look at it, they think like, ah, but how is it possible? And mm -hmm. we're always scratching our heads and we don't think that a story is good enough to be pitched to partners if we don't have that kind of like creative twist that only VR can bring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're consciously thinking of the medium to take advantage of the medium, right? Because I think it's like, it's literally a blank slate. There's so much things you can do and it's just about like the creative process and thinking about like, you're just pushing what's, what the technology is capable of. And so far, every time we have a new story that's coming up, we are able to find something new that we're excited about techno technically. Mm. Um, feel free to come up to the microphone, or I think there's a, in other rooms there was a floating mic. Do you have a question? Come on up. Yeah, hi. Um, yes, so there is this contradiction between you want to do it in VR to be fully immersive, and at the same time, you want to have an impact. Mm -hmm. And um, the funding, like, because there is, you know, no profit made, no market. Basically, that's the thing that I found hasn't changed since the beginning, since mm. 2014. It's still as hard to get any project with an impact funded. So I, I would just like to know your experience and, you know, any advice. The money, uh, all about the money. So that has a lot of layers in there. One, in terms of when you're deciding your project, reach because reach has impact, and if you have it blown out full and interactive in a headset at a festival, what is it, one person every 15 minutes, you try to go see the Magic Leap thing, you probably didn't get in there, that's the bottleneck of that distribution versus reach and funding and all that stuff. How do you handle that? Clearly she was asking about funding. How do you fund these complex projects? Um you can either make your project cheaper or you can spend more time out there in the world looking for money. Um, and so I've done both. Um, sometimes it can be actually kind of freeing to give yourself these constraints of um, you know, not going to the most ambitious, interactive, six-staff world. Um, but just, I mean, so I've done a project where uh, you know, just grabbed a 360 camera and over the course of the weekend um, told a documentary story that ended up going to Sundance. Um, and I think what the benefit there is uh, you're not overwhelmed with the technology uh, and you can kind of focus on like the characters and what makes it interesting. Um, and you're not as constrained obviously by the fundraising side of it. I think there's a world of um, uh, immersive storytelling that can look like the world of, of indie filmmaking where you know folks are making something with their iPhone. Um, we can get into those worlds of um, um, indie content creation, but that shouldn't be the only, uh, yeah. you know, side of things. And so there's the other side of it where um, you spend a couple of years and you knock on a lot of doors and you raise money from all the places you can, whether that's tech companies, whether that's philanthropy, whether that's um, grant funding, whether that's public funding, uh, whether that's um, choosing a project that has uh, uh, an audience already and that's willing to pay for something or um, connecting to a story that would have some funding behind it because it's supporting some kind of interest group or cause. There's a lot of pots of money and they're all hard to go after. And I think that the thing you have to sacrifice is the time that it's gonna to take to bring that story to life. Anyone else wanna chime in? The, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, it's never like the sexiest part of the experience, mm -hmm. but like I've had to work as a group fitness instructor as someone who's like worked in social impact for like VR, AR. Like I can't proclaim to say I've been able to pay my bills and like eat every night really well because I only do social impact in XR. But similar to what Caitlin said, like I have taken the time and energy to build and grow. And now I'm finally at the point where like I can feel like, okay, great, like I get to just do XR and social impact and XR and documentary and XR and journalism. And that's really like such an honor for me to be able to say, but that didn't happen for me overnight. So one to say I recognize that there's a broken system. B, to say that I think what Games for Change and XR for Change is going to be trying to do in the next few years is that they're going to try and build a better system. I think the first few things I can think of off the top of my head that we're working on is a real, um, a real step forward to create a precedent that we not only raise a production budget, but we also raise an impact budget, right? You raise a million dollars to create the experience, but you also raise 500,000, 750,000 to also create the impact because you're right. Even a Nobel Peace Center isn't going to pay you money to bring 16 headsets to the Nobel Peace Center. They'll give you staff, they'll give you support, but they're not going to pay your bills. Someone else has to come in and underwrite that cost. And so I think it's really important that we talk to people like Meta, that we talk to people like HTC Vive and Magic Leap, and we say it's not just about the production, but it's also about what happens after the production is completed, and we need to raise just as much money for both. And starting to set that precedent forward is one thing that I know Games for Change as under the XR for Change category is working on. The second is to create a really robust funding system for impact campaigns. So there will be a social impact grant that gets relaunched through Games for Change, and that will hopefully be a way that we can help absorb some of those costs for a creator. There will also be a system where we start to build a talent pipeline. If you're a creator and you're like, I don't know the first thing about impact, our goal is to now create a talent pipeline for impact producers who have a Games for Change kind of check mark where they've worked with Games for Change, they've worked with XR for Change, they know the system, they know where to go for money, they know where to go to start to make those partnerships with the Nobel Peace Center, with the Met, with the high school classroom, with the university classroom, so that you as the creator don't have to be overwhelmed with doing it all, but you could strategically work with an impact producer, ideally someone who is of your same demographic, of your same background, someone who can get it and work with you in a really seamless way. And that way you can find yourself not feeling so overburdened. So these are three things that are coming down the pipeline in years to come. And that's what's exciting about this kind of newer industry is we get to establish it now, where we want it to go and how we want it to go for impact. And my hope is in a few years, that question can potentially become more null and void because there are systems and support places and support in places for you. Yeah, Victor, how did you get the 9-11 thing funded? Uh, talk about some of those projects. Yeah, th that's, I think you can also bake impact inside of your content and without being necessarily the first thing you're, you're gonna be pushing when you're gonna be looking uh, for, the, for the money to fund this. I mean, this piece was uh, funded by and co-produced by Meta, so mm -hmm. it was for the 20th commemorations. We, want, we had this conversation about you know, doing a piece for the 20th commemorations of 9-11. Uh, and for us, impact is just built and baked inside of the content per se. And then when you actually pitch the content and when platforms realize that actually they need good content to get more viewers, more audience, to get more headsets out there, um, I think the question becomes different is how do you get funding for any kind of content in general? So I think that as long as you kind of craft a good pitch, a good content, and you can bake the impact inside of it, the question is not necessarily about how do you do this for the impact, uh, but how do you just get funding for, for a story? So that's how we've been approaching it um, so far. We've never done an impact campaign uh, such as the one that Michaela is describing, um, but I think that would require a different source of funding that's specifically targeted um, for this because our job as producer, first and foremost, is just to craft a good piece of content, and then we're gonna be thinking about the, the distribution. So we don't necessarily decorrelate the impact from the content, which has, we try to like make it like just be, be as one. There, yeah, there is, um, there's a change and a shift here in terms of where AWE started, where it was technology to the importance of content. You mentioned something uh, before about the pitching and, and that kind of support. Yeah, so earlier, I mean, yesterday I was at the pitching, uh, at the pitch competition for, for startups, and one thing was, that was interesting is all of the startups, I mean, not all of them, but a, a fair amount of them were actually pitching solutions for creators and to ease the creation of content. And I think that right now we've come to a point in the industry where we realize that when people put on a VR headset on, or AR headset, 
they're actually looking at content, whether it be games, entertainment, films, any kind of thing, but it's actually content that they're consuming. And that the enabling force, the driving force of the adoption of these technology is content. And so seeing all this actually like the, the startup, uh, you know, being pitching tools for creators to ease the creation of content, I think shows the evolution of where we're going. And we're not just about like demoing some kind of like crazy tech, but we're about like finding the tools that are going to allow people to create and to consume then the content. The thing that I think about in terms of creating content and the costs for it um, is looking at film industry. There's movies created by this phone, and there's movies created with IMAX expensive cameras and everything in between. And that's the, the space of creation creators uh, producing content in immersive stories and immersive. That landscape is, is growing. Um, one thing that I think about uh, is how technology influences art and art influences technology. Sometimes it works hand in hand. Sometimes there's, there's a tension here. Uh, there are folks, uh, uh, hopefully it's okay for me to share this story for my student, went to a hackathon. He is a storyteller, and he was not welcomed at first at the hackathon. Tech people were like, you have no skills. What are you doing here? Fortunately, he, he was won second place. Him and his storytelling team won second place in the hackathon. The tech people who rejected him did not place. And he rubbed it in their face, I'm told. Um, <laughs> so there's tension sometimes, right? Uh, in this space, there, there are brilliant people creating hardware that I could not even imagine putting together, how the wires connect. Jesus, thank you for them. I write their coattails. From your perspective as a content creator, what are the tension things and how do you as content creators engage with technology? And then I'll ask a follow-up question. How could technologists engage with storytellers in a better way? You can answer both at the same time, but from a creative content creator perspective, how do you engage with technology? What are the tension points there? Anyone can go. Scatter is really all about art informing technology and, and technology informing art. And so we're this kind of hybrid company where on the one side we create these immersive experiences, but then we also create this software product. You know, we're a venture-backed startup. Um, and so those two things really inform each other. When we're um, going into a production, that's really like the R&D lab for our for our software, because um, we need to like figure out how does this thing work? How do people use it? What's wrong with it? Um, let's break it so that we can figure out how to improve it. Um, that really informs our product development. Um, and then in turn, whatever that software can do then determines what we can actually um, do in our, in our storytelling. Um, so one of our, our recent projects, The Changing Same, we had to develop a whole bunch of um, techniques and processes that hadn't been done before in order to serve um, the vision of the creators of the, the, the project, the, um, you know, scatter, a director at Scatter and a director at a um, collaborating studio, Arata Studios. Um, so one thing that we did is uh, develop a pipeline where we created what we call hybrid avatars. So we used volumetric capture to capture kind of real facial expressions and a kind of real person in, in three dimensions. Um, and then combine that with motion capture so we can figure out how people are moving um, and then overlay that to create these kind of fantastical characters that are sort of half real and half magical. Um, and uh, yeah, develop basically this pipeline that uh, hadn't been seen before. Um, and so that, that's kind of like a continuous conversation, like how can we push the boundaries of creativity? How can we push the boundaries of what the tool can do? And then like both sort of push and pull at the, the constraints uh, as well. Um, so we're kind of privileged to be able to yeah. straddle both of those both of those worlds. You, you have an advantage. It's baked into what the company does. Yeah. For y'all, Victor or Michaela, like, is there a tension point when you're trying to get technology into the creation space? Or Victor, is your stuff baked in as well? No, first, the bottleneck is more the distribution. Because you can push the technology as much as you want. At the end, it has to fit into a headset. And if you want the headset to be popular, it has to be a standalone headset. And there's not that many out, you know, out there today. So the, the problem is we could push the tech as much as we want. But at the end, we have to like, just fit it in an application or on a platform. So it's always like this tension of like we have to maximize what's you know, what headsets are capable of. But going further or going beyond that for a company that you know, aims at distributing and having pieces that are seen widely, it's complicated. So the tension point is more like, how far can we go while retaining a good audience and a good distribution channels? And that's where we try to always position you know, the, the productions. And we try to be at the forefront of what we can do. We try to always optimize for what the headsets are going to be a year from now, two years from now. All the video productions we've done are mastered in 8K, but today can only be distributed in 5K. So we have to anticipate for all of this. But the, the, I mean, for us, our problem is just the distribution channel. So 
we can we can put it as much as we want. It's just for us, you know, we have to make sure that people who have like a normal budget who can like maybe put four hundred, five hundred dollars in a headset are able to see the piece that we're producing. Mm. Mm. And I have to take Victor's point like a step further because Victor's talking about putting in a standalone headset and then letting people who have that headset watch it. My job as an impact producer is to think about someone who's never even approached a headset getting into a headset and doing the experience. So my tension point is always about time and energy and compassion spent with people who are not digital natives, right? So a lot of us here are digital natives. Like we know how to get on an iPad, we know how to use a laptop, we are very comfortable putting a headset on our face. But when I put something at a place like Times Square or the Nobel Peace Center or at a high school classroom and I have to work with a teacher or staff member who barely knows how to open up their iPhone and look up their contact list. And we all have those people we know. And instead of approaching them as if they should already know, the goal of what I'm doing with my staff is I'm teaching them compassion and I'm teaching them patience of how we gently onboard somebody into using a headset, how we gently put people into an experience, and then how do we gently take care of somebody after they've come out of headset. And I call those three phase onboarding, story, and aftercare. So I'm constantly reminding my team, how are we doing the onboarding? What is the onboarding laid out? Whether it's the tension points of the actual story, like how do you prep someone to find themselves in 9-11 like as a survivor in that immersive experience? Or how do you prep someone in something like Changing Same, which is a really amazing project about racism? Or something about On the Morning You Awake, which is about nuclear weapons threat and a false ballistic missile alert, right? These are not just lighter subjects we're jumping people into. So first is onboarding them into the content, but it's also now onboarding them into technology. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes patience, and it takes compassion. So that's like one thing I'm constantly thinking about and moving through. And then the other hand is like where I'm kind of struggling a little bit with technologists is authentic collaboration, right? It's not just enough to say, oh, this is a really cool story, let's tell it. It's about who is that person whose story we're telling? How do we completely work with them and their vision for it? How do we make sure they understand the technology we're using to tell their story? How do we make sure there's just as many people in front of the camera as there are behind the camera that look and sound like the person in front of the camera, right? So if there's any chance for me to work on a project, let's say in the Philippines, can I bring on a Filipino VR animation company so that my US dollars aren't just going back into the standard US dollars of companies that work in VR all the time? but actually saying let's invest in the talent pool that's in the Philippines to give them an opportunity to showcase what they can do with VR technologies and actually seeking out those producers and those creatives that aren't as well known and aren't just maybe the darlings of the industry and giving them a platform or giving them a way to collaborate with one another and really being authentic about that, not just to say we're doing a piece about X, but actually saying well then who's behind our table to make the decisions that we're doing a piece about X. And that's a big, a big part that I find I'm not only kind of jutting up against technologists, I'm even jutting up against traditional journalists, mm -hmm. I'm jutting up against traditional documentarians, and it's fun because this is again the time and space to change those trajectories and say, well, let's make it this trajectory where yeah. like, you know, standing up here like Asian American, like black, whatever, we don't even don't have to look at those. Month. Yeah, we just get to do it. <laughs> yeah, I'll add something to that. You're talking about like, who's getting to tell the stories, mm -hmm. whose stories are getting told. But there's another layer of like, who are we telling these stories to? to. Totally. Um, and yes. I think, that, you know, to your point about distribution, uh, one of the sad things is a lot of times these really amazing projects get created and they live and die on the festival circuit because that's where the tools exist to show them. Um, and so I think we need to also be thinking about like uh, uh, bringing those people who are going to watch the projects, thinking about their experience in watching projects, um, at the creation phase so we can be planning for those obstacles. Yeah, and that's, that's why Games for Change has raised like half a million dollars outside of production to say this project's important, let's not let it live and die in the festival circuit. Let's fund bringing headsets to people. Let's fund the curriculum. Let's talk to the high school students. Let's talk to the teachers. Because that's like basically what an impact campaign is, right? To say like, how do we make an impact not just on the festival circuit, but for everyone who doesn't live in the festival circuit? So I agree, like it's such an important part. One thing I'll add to that is, uh, I was telling the panel, um, there's someone influential in our industry that taught a class and tweeted out, hey, tagged a bunch of people and said, hey, help my students. I don't know if they were aware, but every, the eight people that they tagged were all white men. And then within 48 hours later, tweeted out again and asked an engagement of the community that were all white men except for one woman of color. 
Um, so progress there. But if this influential person is only engaging with that demographic, we're going to fall into the same problems that led to every platform excluding all these voices and creators. I will disclose always that women of color are the ones who taught me how to stitch. Women have taught me how to stitch. Nani de la Pena showed me stuff. Christina Heller at her house showed me how to stitch 360 video that started my journey into this. And now I have my diverse students producing these pieces, right? But if we aren't actively recruiting these voices, empowering these creators, it's going to exclude so many people again. So that's one of my fears. And as a creator, encourage people to jump in. Sir, you have a question? Yeah, this is a really great uh, uh, setup for the question that I have, which is about, you've talked about having very compelling characters in the stories that you are telling. Um, but how do you think about the user that is in that space also as a character? How are you designing or thinking about what how, how that person is going to leave your experience and also become a storyteller themselves after they have lived through the stories that you're mm. creating. What is the kind of world building? How are you thinking about that? And you started to touch on some of it already, but I wanted to ask kind of more specifically that question of centering the user as one of those characters, or are they sort of experiencing it from a third person point of view, or are they experiencing it like they are that person? Are they embodied? Is it disembodied? All of those kinds of concepts around the, this new kind of taxonomy of, um, of this new way of storytelling that we have with VR. I think all of these are editorial choices that you make for each different, uh, for each different piece. Uh, our line at Targo has been very clear from the beginning. We don't want the user to be like, actively participating uh, in a scene. I think there's a lot of questions about ethics also in VR that come to this when you're talking about trauma, like these kind of like, events that can be a bit shaking. So having a distance between the story and the, the person who's actually like watching the story is important. Um, I like the idea of just being a viewer. I don't think we should like necessarily consider VR as like a totally different you know uh, realm. I think we can VR is just an evolution of like all the different uh, formats that you have. So all the questions that we have about how do you make someone participate in the story for us is just about you're a viewer in that scene and you have someone who's talking to you as we are talking now, um, but you don't have like sort of like agency. It's still about a story and. Our vision is that a story has a pace and that you can't necessarily alter it. So um, for us, it's about just sharing the space, not necessarily sharing the way the story is being told. Yeah, I agree that it's, it's definitely project dependent. There's not like a, a right way to do it. Um, something that I think about a lot is eye contact, because that, for me, like, defines what is the relationship between um, your, your audience member, your user, and um, the characters uh, in the story. Um, and it's something you have to think about a lot um, if you're planning any kind of you know, uh, freedom of movement experience, uh, because you know, unless you can uh, plan for that eye tracking, you really need to determine, um, do you want your character to be holding the gaze uh, or not? Um, but yeah, I think it really depends on, on what is the kind of experience you're trying to, trying to generate and what is that interaction. Um, and we're talking a lot about uh, VR, but I, you know, obviously immersive doesn't live and die there. Um, I think there's a lot of exciting work being done in augmented reality and even other kind of you know, uh, browser-based formats or game formats. There's other ways of, of generating um, you know, immersive worlds that uh, you know, give your audience members some level of um, uh, uh, engagement and, and autonomy. Um, but don't necessarily like create um, a new identity for that user within a, within a world. And just to add about the, the eye contact, just when we're filming someone where we're interviewing somebody, we always ask the people to treat the camera as a person. So you never get too close, you never get too far. You kind of like, you know, you, you look at the camera, so you have the eye contact when we're talking about film. It's much easier than when you're talking about volumetric. Uh, but yeah, treat the camera as a person is usually the best way to go if you don't want to have something that's weird or a bit awkward in VR. I think it really depends on the purpose of the project. Like, if your purpose is to show something really specific, or if your purpose is to feel something really specific, that'll help you di dictate your choices. And that doesn't even come down to, am I, is my audience embodied or disembodied? Those are like the subtle choices you can sometimes make to say, is my audience crouched down below her, or is my audience above her, right? Like, what power hierarchy are you building with your audience and your kind of story? Uh, it could also even be what medium you tell your story. Uh, I told a story about Filipino children, and instead of 
creating a poverty porn piece, I decided to do it in animation instead. So it wasn't just a real life 360 video of seeing poverty over and over again. So these really like clear decisions you can make as a creator, I think is really about the purpose, right? And so my purpose with that piece was empowerment and hope and the fact that there was a nonprofit working to help those children, right? So it wasn't a piece about despair. It wasn't a piece about intensity. So I made choices to embody that feeling um, and to embody that impact. So I think, you know, if your impact is to say, I want my audience to see themselves in a very specific way, like I want the audience to feel a vibration and look at the hand and they can see something in their hand, then that's, that right there is like your purpose, right? Like what is that interaction and why is that purpose versus saying I want my audience to see themselves with tentacles growing out of their fingers, right? So like thinking about the purpose will help, I think, pull out some of those questions you have and give you a path to start to explore. I think that's one of the newest, most challenging kind of editorial choices. A lot of these we're talking about as 360 video, but I think of Ink Stories they created that high impact with the piece called Hero, which uh, at the end, you're, I think you're a journalist. I've described this piece, I didn't do it. Uh, and you, you're a journalist covering a disaster and you see a hand sticking out of the rubble and you reach your hand to get it and it's the volunteer just waiting for you to grab their hand, right? So simple, but really powerful because they go and they feel that person's hand. They also did a piece called Blindfold with Oculus DK1 um, and you're being interviewed somewhere in the Middle East. You're a photographer, you captured, uh, I, I did this and it was amazing because it didn't have the ability of you communicate, but the interrogator has your friend there. Really poly, you know, not great looking graphics, but was really intense where the interrogator is asking me, should I shoot your friend? And I, my body language was like, no, 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 no. And, and I'm not looking. He's like, should I shoot your friend? I'm like, no, no. And the, all it is was the sensor capturing my head doing this to communicate the next level of engagement. That's really intense, but it's also really freaking complicated to a certain extent that uh, that barrier of entry may be too high for content creators, right? That's great for gamers. And so th these are these tension points that have such impact, and as the technology evolves and the barrier of entry gets lowered, that is a new type of thing that unlocks, right? One of the things for 360 and other VR stuff was never move the viewer, because they'll immediately throw up, and we problem solve that. Uh, don't move them this way unexpectedly, <laughs> move them forward in a steady pace. That unlocked a bunch of different types of storytelling, and as the technology evolves and becomes easier, as another tool in our toolkit to tell stories, that will make those stories richer and a more viable option, depending on your funding and your deadline and the complexity of your story and, of course, the purpose. And even voice, like I think of Cassandra by Gayatri and, and no, now where media, like it's about dying languages and your voice you saying the language activates you to continue oh, the experience, awesome. right? Or like, I think of Terminal 3 by Asad J. Yeah. Malik, where like, you are literally using your voice to continue the experience because you're interviewing and being and interrogating. And so there's so many things to think about beyond just like, is my, bot, is my audience embodied or disembodied? But like, these are all What's their tools purpose? in our toolkit mm -hmm. that we can put in and say, let's move forward. Thank you. We have just a few more minutes, I guess, like 10 more minutes. And please come up to the mic if you have a question. I just have a question. You guys have talked about a bunch of, um, you know, sort of VR 180 and 360 experiences that are worthwhile. And I've been mostly, you know, as someone who's just on the Quest 2 or the Oculus, it seems like there are some great things to find, but it's the curation seems to be a little bit lacking in terms of like, there's all this stuff over the last five years at festivals. Like, why isn't there a festival selection that like you can really read great descriptions and it, it's and that. Could it be streamable and still be in great content? Like, it feels like Meta is not like stepping up to like it exists. Like, let's, especially if you have an 8K version, like there are players that can play 8K in streaming right now. Like, it's it's not that crazy in H.265. So, like, that is what's a, what's going on. That's yeah, upsetting. such a complicated, simple question with complexities that are frustrating. Uh, what is your take to, to, what's your answer to that question? Why isn't there a more simplified way for all these diverse, high-impact pieces? I wish there was. Um, I know in the early days, uh, there was a company that was kind of trying to be the HBO of immersive content and was a kind of a platform that existed within these other uh, tech platforms. Um, and they were too early. They just, there wasn't enough content to create 
curate the best of it. Um, and so they pivoted and do kind of like fitness stuff these days. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that, you know, as, as but there, there is more content now, and there's a lot of great content out there. Um, so maybe it's time for that next HBO of immersive to exist. But I think one of the key elements is also that uh, no one here is willing to pay to watch a 360 film. Uh, that's one of the, like, that's the hard reality of what we do when we're in a VR headset. We're just going to click on, you know, the, the TV or the film video platform, uh, but it's all free. So it's also difficult to like, for them to be able to like push and give more visibility to all these projects because in the end they also need, you know, what's, what's making money and what's sustaining, I think, today the industry is the games. Uh, because that's what people are using and that's what people are paying for. So I think uh, all these impact projects, all the documentary projects, all the film projects have a hard time just uh, getting more real estate in the VR headset just because they are not, we haven't found yet the model. So w our roles, I think, is really about making sure that we keep on pushing and we find what's going to be working, you know, in terms of like a revenue model uh, on these platforms. Um, but I think that this is a key element that we have to keep in mind where we're thinking of like, why don't we see it more? I'd love to see, you know, the pieces that we've produced, you know, front and center every time we, you know, we, I, I open the Oculus headset. But I guess that this is just a market and we need to keep on pushing to find the, the viable business models. But, um, but I guess that it's a work in progress and it doesn't mean that it's going to stay like this forever. Do you want to chime in on? I mean, I agree. Great projects live and die in Oculus Media and VR animation player, especially if you're someone who likes animation. So I would say I have a bit of like a, like a, a glass is, ha is half full, not half empty. Like, if you are a MetaQuest user, like, demand a better user experience for all of us. Like, demand the fact that you want to see high-end 360 video on the homepage. Like, you can make comments on every single experience. Like, make a comment to be like, hey, this would be great to see on the homepage. And star at five stars. And, like, you know, maybe if you have a contact at Meta that you know works as a developer. Like, I know we all are sort of in a smaller bubble. Like, say, hey, like, why isn't there a shelf of, like, really high-end content? Because to me, you know, it, you might feel like you're just a raindrop, but your raindrop plus how many more raindrops can create a tidal wave and change the shape of the beach. So, like, that would be my thing is, like, Meta's always driving towards their user, and yes, you might be paying for the Star Trek and the Star Wars, and I'm all for that because I pay for those too, but they're also wanting to know what the user wants to see in their menu, and if there's more users on there with a curated taste to want to see these types of immersive documentary impact-based projects, you know color me like a hopeful, but I hope to say like they would listen to that too. Yeah, uh, I, I've talked to folks at festivals that I didn't go to and was like, how can you, I see your thing. And if they're a friend, they'll send you the file to sideload into the headset. Or one person told me like, no, I'm not going to give it to you to show it to your students because I need to get paid to show my stuff. And so that's one financial reason. Another reason I was talking to someone who uploaded their experience onto Steam, which can help with distribution, but the comments were offensively just tearing it apart because the users were like, this video game sucks. And it wasn't a video game. It was talking about domestic abuse or something like that. Um, so it's just a different culture and, and things like that. Um, there was I just, another I, ju I just wanted to point, I don't know if you have um, followed this, but Michel Rea of the one of the Venice Festival curator, they have partnered with Cannes and Tribeca. If I remember correctly, I read this that they are planning to do such a platform because they are as frustrated as all of us with you know the regular gaming um, distribution stores. So I hope this project goes forward. That yeah, they want to bring it beyond the festivals and not just the pieces selected at the festivals, but the more narrative storytelling uh, store. Yeah. yeah, it's also tricky too in terms of the walled garden. You know, Meta wants to curate and fund and decide what goes into the Meta Quest headsets. Um, that's a tension point too. Have you thought about that distribution and doing WebXR uh, so it's more accessible in all headsets? Yeah, just one last thing on this. Today, w the, the place where we get the most views is Oculus TV. So it's probably not the perfect uh, you know, place to find the content, but that's still one of the most biggest like, distribution channels that we've been able um, to find. So, and just about the misconception around, around VR. So when we released the 9-11 uh, documentary that we had done, um, we showed it at South by Southwest, and some people thought that it was a game just because it was mm. VR. And we had to explain to them that it was a story, a documentary, that it was a distance, it was not about reliving the events. And it takes also a lot of explaining 
Uh, because today, like we probably here in this room think about VR as a storytelling tool, but most of the people, when they right. see a VR headset, they think about Beat Saber, they think about games. And, and honestly, that's our role to like educate, show, and just you know, put our works uh, out there. But uh, yes, the user base also today is very much gamer influenced, I think. Yeah, they're developers, incredibly talented developers that are turning their skills into murdering zombies, murdering robots, murdering uh, red shapes, murdering Nazis, which are fucking amazing games, but there's a lot more to our immersive uh, toolkit, a lot more stories to tell. Uh, and it takes creators like you and all of you to really make that space be more vibrant. Um, I see that we should wrap up. Yeah, I just uh, want to say thank you, you to you creators. What, what an incredible final panel for this great interview. Thank you. Keep on creating.